to start with very uh, innocent looking expression that something like you take say function which is differentiable is necessarily continuous right. Now, I give you a function which is twice differentiable then immediately you conclude it is also continuous because when you say twice differentiable it means first derivative exists second derivative exists. Now, the other one you saw that first derivative exists then it is continuous right. So, that means you have one added premise here second derivative also exists. Now, if some premises are added then the earlier conclusion still hold right. So, that is a property which is violated in many logics, but that holds in proportional logic and in mathematics in general. So, you start with that huh? that is called the property of monotonicity for the entailment relation. So, you start with our first result which is called monotonicity. So, we start with two sets of propositions B where we would say that sigma is a subset of gamma. So, there are more premises now. Let W be a proposition. So, what we say is that if from sigma follows w then from gamma also follows w. This is one form of the monotonicity. There is another form which says if sigma is unsatisfiable then so is gamma. So, essentially what we do we assume that sigma entails w which means every model of sigma is a model of w. Now, we want to show that gamma enters w. So, let i be a model of gamma right. Since gamma includes more propositions possibly then i is also a model of sigma right. A model of a set means it should satisfy all the propositions at a time. So, all the propositions gamma are satisfied by i therefore, all the propositions sigma are also satisfied by i that is i is also a model of sigma. So, once i is a model of sigma by assumption sigma enters w. So, i is a model of w and that is it we wanted to show that. If you start with any interpretation which is a model of gamma it has to be a model of w that is what we have shown is it clear ok. So, let us write it. Suppose sigma enters W, let I be a model of gamma. As sigma is a subset of gamma, I is also a model of sigma. Okay. Since sigma enters W, I is also a model of W, and the proof is complete we have started with any model of gamma we have ended with that is a model of w therefore, gamma enters w. So, once you have done that the second one should be immediate not as a corollary, but we have used the crucial fact that each model of gamma is also a model of sigma. So, if sigma is unsatisfiable there is no model of sigma therefore, there is no model of gamma because otherwise if there is a model of gamma then that would have been a model of sigma whereas, sigma has none is that right. So, we go to the next property this is easy huh? next one is also easy which says that when you prove something it says sigma entails w what you do essentially is assume sigma assume negation of w derive a contradiction. So, as a proof method you always follow it proof by contradiction or whose original term is reductio ad absurdum reduce it to absurdity right that is the name. So, how do we formulate it now? It says 
process so should we write the complete expression so this has sigma entails w if and only if sigma union not w is unsatisfiable is that right so you have to write what sigma and w are It has also another form which plays with this w or not w. So, we say sigma entails not w if and only if sigma union w is unsatisfiable. And do it by contradiction, you can assume that sigma union not w is satisfiable, mm -hmm. then there exists some model i which uh, satisfies, I mean, uh, some model for sigma union not w. Mm. This implies that uh, i is a model of sigma and i is also a model for not w, but if i is a model for sigma then i has to be a model for w, which means mm. i cannot Acceptable. Yeah. But again you are using the same <coughs> thing what you are proving <coughs> in some sense. You are proving by contradiction, what you are proving? Proof yeah. by contradiction. Uh, <laughs> not w is unsatisfied. I mean you are proving proved by contradiction <coughs> by contradiction it is ok it is not wrong huh? can you avoid that you want to show if sigma entails w then sigma union not w is unsatisfiable ok. So, you are assuming sigma entails w now how to show this is unsatisfiable you take any interpretation i that will evaluate it to 0 it will not be a model of sigma union not w right that is what you want to show because you are starting with models you are getting problem start with the interpretations so that it is not a model right. So, now suppose i is one interpretation of sigma union not w you want to show i is a not not a model of sigma union not w right. So, now you have information on sigma entails w. So, that means, if i is a model of sigma, it has to be a model of w, right. So, it cannot be a model of not w, therefore, it is not a model of sigma union not w. Is that clear? But these are for all interpretations which are models of sigma. There can be some interpretations which are not models of sigma, right. So, if that is so, then what happens? Okay, provided sigma is non empty. Huh? If sigma is not so, then it is clear from the beginning, right? W is valid if and only if not W is unsatisfiable, right? If sigma is empty, so you forget the empty case. Is it clear now? Okay, so let's write the proof. 1 let i be a model of let i be an interpretation so if i is a model of sigma we have now two cases i either is a model of sigma or it is not a model of sigma if i is a model of sigma then as sigma entails w i is a model of w that is i is not a model of not w ok. Therefore, i is not a model of sigma union not w ok. 
is it clear? That proves one. In the first case, when I is a model of sigma. So if I is not a model of sigma, then I is not a model of sigma union not W. Because sigma union not W is a superset of sigma, so it is not a model of sigma union not W. So, in either case, you get I is not a model of sigma union not W, therefore, sigma union not W is unsatisfiable. So, that proves one side of that if and only if statement of one, there is one more which we have to start from sigma union not w is unsatisfiable, then prove that sigma entails w, fine. Okay. So, conversely suppose sigma union not w is unsatisfiable. We want to show that sigma entails W, right? So how to show sigma entails W? By definition, we have to take a model of sigma, so that that is a model of W, right? So we start with a model of sigma. Our aim is to show that I is a model of W. Okay? Now what happens? I is a model of sigma. But sigma union not W is unsatisfiable. So, that means I is not a model of sigma union not W. What does it say? I of every proposition in sigma equal to 1, but I of not every proposition in sigma union not W is 1. So, where it is going wrong? At not W. So, that means I of not W is 0. So, this says I is not a model of not W, that is I is a model of W, that proves 1. See, so you have the ideas, it is not difficult to see what is going on, but only problem you are facing is writing it correctly, uh, that is why I am writing it again. You have to reproduce, this is the way we have to write, there is no other way. You have to use their meta symbols, you have to use the correct arguments and so on, that is all. They are simple otherwise. Now, what about second one? Do you have to prove it again? Hmm? Replace W by not W, not W by W in the above proof, <laughs> you would get it. Okay. So, you just write similar to one. Fine. Now, if you see redox word absurdum and compare that with monotonicity, there are two statements similarly in monotonicity. So, can you see? what the second one is telling. It says sigma is unsatisfiable, then gamma is also unsatisfiable. Now, instead of sigma, suppose I take sigma union not w, right. If sigma union not w is unsatisfiable, then gamma union not w is unsatisfiable, okay. then I get the first one by redox word upside down. Okay. That is why they are listed under the same monotonicity. To see from this to this is not so quick because this is for arbitrary sigma, not especially in the form sigma union W or not W. But you can always find out one and put it in the form not W, provided you accept the law of double negation. 
if nothing is negated then how to bring it well you can take w is equivalent to not of not w so it is in the form of not of some x right so that's why both the things are same really due to reduction or adoption okay we'll give another common proof procedure which we use in mathematics that is it is also simple but we have to formulate it suppose you want to prove one conditional statement right say sigma n tells x implies y right if x then y then what do you do do you just assume sigma and produce if x then y what you do is you take sigma along with that assume also x and prove only y right but these two are different things one says sigma n tells x implies y another says sigma union x n tells y is that right these two are same that is what we are going to prove okay so that is called the deduction theorem so we take a set of propositions which will be our premises and let us take two other propositions then what it says is sigma n tells x implies y if and only if sigma union x n tells y so formulation is correct then you can prove how to prove this so there are again two parts eh? it's an if and only if statement so let's assume sigma enters x implies y try to show that sigma union x enters y okay so suppose sigma n tells x implies y our aim is to show sigma union x n tells y fine so that means we have to start with a model of sigma union x and end with showing that it is a model of y okay so let i be a model of sigma union x means sigma n tells x implies y and i is a model of sigma i has to be a model of x implies y i is a model of sigma because it is a model of a bigger set okay i of everything in sigma union x is 1 so i of everything in sigma is also 1 it is a model of sigma so now what you have got i is a model of x implies y but i is a model of sigma union x so that itself gives i is a model of x fine now i of x equal to 1 i of x implies y equal to 1 what can be y it can't be zero anyway if it is zero then you would get i is a non model of x implies y right so then i is a model of y that proves first part okay so we just have to write it therefore sigma union x n tells y now for the other part so here we have to show that sigma enters x implies y right this is what we have to show so you have to start with the model of sigma so let i be a model of sigma our aim is to show that i is a model of x implies y okay now how do we proceed hmm 
there will be two cases now, right? Because we have x there already. To use that, we have to consider that case first. Then we will see if it is not a model. What to do? Okay. So now, case A, it says that if i is a model of x, then we have i as a model of sigma union x. Because of this assumption, sigma union x entails y. I has to a model of y. Right? So I of y equal to one. If I of y equal to one, I of x implies y equal to one. That's what we have seen earlier, right? So then, I is also a model of x implies y. What about second case? If i is not a model of x, then clearly i is a model of x implies y. Because i of x equal to 0, so i of x implies y has to be 1. So, there ends the proof. Right now, let us start using this. Suppose we revisit the example what we did in the last class. So, we want to show P implies R implies Q and P implies R and tells P implies Q. Let us say this example. Now, to show this, you can always use the truth table that we have done yesterday. Okay. Now, let us see deduction theorem, how is it useful. So, by deduction theorem, since this is the, this is one in the form of x implies y, we can use deduction theorem. So, it is enough to show, enough to show by deduction theorem. that P implies R implies Q, P implies R, bring P to this side and then Q. Is it okay? Now, imagine what is happening in terms of the truth table. In the truth table, you have 8 rows, right. Now, here you have only 4 rows to show it because p already has been assigned to 1. You have to consider only those interpretations which are models of the premises. Okay? So, p is assigned to 1, half of the truth table goes. Right? Now, itself you can construct the truth table and job is over. Is it clear? It will be easier now. Right? So, now let us see if p is 1, p implies r is 1, r has to be 1 you can argue that way also. So, now again another half of the truth table is gone. Huh? Only two interpretations you have to look. Give P 1, R 1, Q 0 R 1. Now, with Q 0, this becomes 0, which is not possible. Therefore, Q has to be 1. Right? It is easy to see now. Clear? Now, suppose you want to use redux word upside down. Now onwards, what will you do? Again, you can say it is enough to show by redux word of Saddam that P implies R implies Q, P implies R, P and not Q is unsatisfiable. How do you proceed? That again is easy, the same way you can argue. Take any interpretation, okay. In order that you are trying to make it satisfiable, you will be assigning P to 1, Q to 0, because not Q is 1, and then argue. 
okay. p is 1, q is 0. So, since p is 1, p implies r has to be 1, so r has to be 1. So, now r is 1, q is 0, p is 1, this is 0, it is unsatisfiable. Right. So, any interpretation which is a model of all these three cannot be a model of this, that is what you have shown. Therefore, this set is unsatisfiable. It is not a particular interpretation you are taking. Your argument is take any interpretation which is a model of all these three, then it can never satisfy this. Therefore, it is unsatisfiable. Okay. One of your laws says that P or not P is valid. Right? This is called the law of excluded middle, either P or not P, nothing is in between. There have been many objections to this law, but that is a separate matter. In professional logic, it holds that we know, because P can be either 0 or 1, whenever P is 1, you get 1 interpretation if p is 0, then not p becomes 1, so r is 1. right? So, this statement or this proposition is always evaluated to 1, therefore, it is valid. right? Now, from the validity of p or not p, I can just write that this is also valid. Independently, you can see that this is valid, but I am not going for that. What I am asserting is that from the law of excluded middle, I can derive that this is also valid. Okay. So, what does that mean? There is something in my mind, huh? so you have to read it. Well, negation of P implies Q is P and not P. That is the law of implication. Okay. So, there is another law. That means, I am using two laws. One is excluded middle, another is negation of P implies Q is P and not Q. This also you use almost everywhere in proving theorems. Suppose, P implies Q does not hold, then what do you do? Assume P, assume not Q and proceed. So, P implies Q is equivalent to uh, its negation is equivalent to P and not Q. Verified by the truth table. What we are asserting is P implies Q, if you consider its negation is P and not Q. Right? So, that means I can write first this as P implies Q or P and not Q is equivalent to P implies Q or negation of P implies Q. This is what I am studying. Right? Since these two are equivalent. Now, what I say? This is same thing. Since I have excluded middle, x or not x is valid, this is also valid. What about this argument? You are just substituting P implies Q in place of P and then telling that it is correct. There is another substitution here, P and not Q is equivalent to not of P implies Q. So, this substitution is also allowed and finally, this is equivalent to top since I have law of excluded middle. So, there are two kinds of substitutions involved here. Right? First one is P and not Q is equivalent to not of P implies Q. So, which is our Euclidean principle we have followed in geometry, right? Equals can be substituted for equals. That is what we have done here. Right? The other one is different. This one is telling something like if x plus y whole square equal to x square plus y square plus 2 x y, then 3 plus 4 whole square equal to 3 square plus 4 square plus 2 into 3 into 4. Right? So, this is another kind of substitution. In place of these propositional variables, you can substitute any 
proposition right but this needs justification as you have told huh? how can we say that well we have to prove two substitution theorems now huh? that equals can be substituted for equal and then uniform substitution can be used fine so let's look at uniform substitution first so this is the problem in logic whatever you have assumed till now you have to prove now you have assumed always that substitutions can be made. Now, you have to show that yes, substitutions can be made by using our definition of interpretations and models. Okay. So, let us introduce a symbol say x is a proposition p is a propositional variable. y is another proposition possibly different from x and it can be same as x also. Now, you say x p replaced by y is the proposition obtained from x by substituting each occurrence of p by y in x. Okay. So, that is why it is called uniform substitution. You can read this symbol as p is uniformly replaced by y in x to get the proposition x p equal to y. So, an example is here what we have done. In place of p, we have substituted p implies q, right? that is what we have done. Then what the statement should be? This is uniform substitution. It says, if x is valid, then x p equal to y is also valid. Fine. Now, how do you prove this? That happens now when you become addicted to two wheeler, you will never try to walk. Okay. So, since you have you are using the terms interpretations, models and so on, you are forgetting the truth table. Huh? Just look at the truth table for x, x is valid, look at the truth table for x. Now, somewhere there p is occurring, p is having 0 or 1, it is a proportional variable. right? So, now instead of p, you have substituted y. So, truth value for y can be 0 or 1 even if it is 1 does not matter always, still it is there in the truth table. So, a portion of the truth table is still there, but everywhere x column it is 1. So, everywhere this also will be 1, right. Is it clear? But if you want to give another syntactic proof proceed by induction that is also possible. Okay. And that induction can be done many ways on the number of occurrences of connectives as usual or you can say how many p's have been replaced, how many occurrence of p is there in x that is also ok, fine, but this semantics is clear. So, there is nothing to do, fine. So, an example is here what we have done in place of p we have substituted p implies q, right. So, since p or not p is equivalent to top p implies q or not of p implies q is equivalent to top. That is how it will be used. Fine. Next let us go to equivalent substitution. So, again we have to introduce a notation for equivalent substitution. So, suppose x is a proposition where 
well we can take some more see y and z are also the positions and say y is equivalent to z we are concerned with equivalences now okay now denote by x where y is substituted equivalently so we give a subscript here e for that symbol equal to z so this is obtained from x by replacing now we are liberal we don't say each occurrence as we have done in that uniform substitution it's that is uniform this is not uniform necessarily so we say by replacing sum of the occurrences of x by y by z so this sum may be nothing may be all so let's call this replaced version of x as x y equivalence replacement with z so y is equivalently replaced by z a precondition is y should be equivalent to z otherwise you cannot substitute you cannot use this notation fine then what do we get so what do you have there you can write equivalence you can write validity or entailment some notation you can give okay so let us write first entailment if u entails v then u y equivalently replaced by z should entail v y equivalently replaced by z you may go for the second one if u is equivalent to v then u y is equivalently replaced by z should be equivalent to v where y is replaced equivalently with z so as a special case you can get if u is valid then u where y is replaced by z is also valid because v you can take as top top is a proportional constant there if you replace nothing happens it remains the same right so now again how do we prove consider the truth table for u and v also both at the same time right a truth table where u occurs where v also occurs fine now when u entails v is evaluated you are taking some of the portion of the truth table where you have only models for u in all such cases you find that there are also models of v right now in u there might be some y's okay so they have been evaluated to either 1 or 0 something but since y is equivalent to z so in place of y if you look at z column there are also zero or one correspondingly right so it doesn't matter in the truth table whether it is y or z is the truth values which are important in the truth table fine and the truth values of y and z are same right so therefore the truth value columns for u where y is replaced by z or v will be same as u and v okay that's all So that justifies the statement. Okay, is that answering your question? So if P or not P is top, uh, sorry, we come from where? This one, P and not Q can be replaced by not of P implies Q. Still, they will be equivalent. Okay, so these two theorems really give us some way 
to use our previous laws, whatever laws we have mentioned and some others are there, they can be used now to prove some more equivalences. Right? We can show some equivalences, some consequences to be valid by using those laws. 